Yeah, we're back. We're live. This is Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. Um, the handsome fellow with me is Lou Puderisi. And, um, you know, we were going to talk about uh, energy. Well, we always talk about energy in one way or another. Right. Sometimes it's it's less connected. But, you know, energy, the economy, it, that's all totally connected. <laughs> so although we're going to, you know, we touch on birds and wind turbines, uh, we're going to skip that for now. Okay, Lou? Instead, we're going to yeah, talk I mean, about COVID. <laughs> We can get to that one when, when the wind turbines go back to work. <laughs> There's so many other things to talk about right, and worry right. about, I might add. You know, it's, it's like uh, these guys were having a conversation and somebody said, uh, oh, you know, it's amazing how the Chinese developed this, uh, this, uh, this, this, uh, this um, you know, virus and it only hits older people. So what's the point? Of the, uh, weaponizing it, Jeff. What's the point of <laughs> developing a virus that just hits older people? Is there a point in that? Who would do that? And, and the answer is nobody would do that. And yet, here we have, and you have data to show that older people are really getting the shaft here uh, in large numbers. Maybe we weren't so fully aware up till now exactly how many of them were dying and how unsuccessful our efforts have been, you know, to protect them. Right. And why don't we, I mean, I think one of the interesting things that's happening now is, and let me just say, if you're going to see energy in America come back, people are going to have to have the confidence to go to work. They're going to have to have the money to buy airplane tickets. So, and they're going to have to, you know, uh, buy automobiles, do all the things you need in a normal functioning economy. I saw some data today that if you go sector by sector, huge numbers of companies, run out of money from 20 to 40 days. If they don't have any revenue, they just run out. Now there are uh, assistance coming in the, you know, the paycheck protection program and stuff, but those programs are always hit or miss. They work for some people, not others. And the answer to this problem is to figure out how to balance public health, but also recognize that the cost of the lockdown are massive. Yeah, who's actually working on that, Lou? You working on that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I am working on that. In fact, yesterday I helped a colleague who's getting ready to publish something in the Journal of Transplantation. I'll show you a slide of a forthcoming uh, today. So may maybe we should just go through the data and talk about what we know now. Uh, and uh, I well, have that's a really a, short conversation, isn't it? Yeah, no, no, we know quite a bit actually. <laughs> uh, we, we're learning a lot, and we have a lot of data about how different procedures are working or not working. Okay. So, I'd like to show you uh, a table from a forthcoming article that's going to appear by Dr. Held. Uh, let's go to the first slide. Here. This shows the mortality for the U.S. population for everyone greater than at the age of 64. You might be getting close to that age, Jay, as far as I know. Well, many years to go before I reach that age. Yeah. <laughs> and you can see here from the data that uh, for this population, your walking around crude death rate, annual death rate is about four and a half percent. That when you get out of bed as anyone who's above in this huge, it's a very huge cohort, People, of course, above 80 have a higher number than people at 64, but the average for this group is about four and a half percent. And from what we know under a worst case- What, scenario, what does that mean out of, uh, out of every, uh, of, out of every 100, 100 people, people that, that contract about, the disease? No, 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 no. This has nothing to do with, we're not gotten to COVID-19 yet. The four and a half percent, 4.48% is all the things that happen to you gunshot wounds, auto accident, heart disease, cancer. That's what's called in the vital statistics world, the crude death rate. Okay. And the crude death rate, just your walking around death rate is about four to five per hundred, right? So when you get out of bed, walk around, sometime during this year, you have about a four and a half percent chance of not getting to the end of the year, okay? Just has to do with everything that happens to people in this age group. Thank you for that nice thought. Yeah. Well, you know, we can't live forever. Okay, so now, and so the question is, what does, if you took 
200,000 deaths, right? 200,000, which is a pretty worst case scenario, and allocated it just to this group, how much does it increase the mortality rate? And actually, it increases it from about 4.5% to about 5.2%. 5.25%. And the reason these guys are working on this now is because the folks that do transplants right, are looking at what? Their failure to get kidneys, hearts, all the kinds of transplants that take place. Their failure to make those operations now because they can't, uh, people are, you know, they can't get access to the hospitals or People are worried about infections, whatever reasons the doctors are in lockdown, we're not working on COVID-19, that the mortality rate of these folks is going to go up by a lot. So one of the things that's very hard for people to understand is that everything in life requires trade-offs. Right? So when some politician gets up and says, we, you know, we don't put value on life, Every life is priceless. Well, in a way, every life is priceless. On the, other, on the other hand, we as a society make decisions all the time. And those decisions, decide, those decisions are that we are willing to accept a certain level of risk to do a certain number of things. I just think that's a reality that is lost on the public generally. Uh, they send, tend to view these things as random or things like that. But society as a whole makes decisions all the time. Now, I think what's very interesting... There has to be a moral, um, a moral thread in all of that. Um, you know, you, of course, people die. And of course, decisions result in deaths. Uh, or at least they shorten lives. They shorten. But the, the question is, is whether whether what you're doing is necessary, you know? And the question is also, have you applied a moral stamp on it? Because sometimes it's, it isn't worth it. That a life is more important than the initiative involved. Um, and so, you know, there's a whole right. kind and of a philosophical problem, approach to this. Yeah, it, and, and I don't think, uh, you know, government really incorporates that kind of thinking these days. They do, but it's very poorly done. It's very poorly done. For example, they have a statistical calculation. They know if they build a road a certain way, they can spend more money and make it safer. But how much more money should they spend to reduce one statistical life? It's not a real life, it's a statistical calculation, you know, something some accountant does. And the other problem is in a lot of environmental studies and things is that they look at the benefits per life saved, right? How much should they put on that? Because they are going to spend money. And I think one of the interesting thing is on the, a lot of the work on the economists did on COVID-19, uh, we're trying to suggest that the lockdown was worthwhile because they were using very high numbers, 2.2, 2.5 million deaths. And they were uh, applying $10 million for every life saved. But the models were not very good for the lockdown. And, you know, we have argued, or I have argued in an article I did in Real Clear Markets, was that uh, we could do a lot better than do a lockdown. We could focus on where the high returns are. And I think we have some... Well, I mean, but nobody will, nobody will say that the uh, say United that. States government did a good job here. And, and I say that that really means Trump because he was calling the shots in every direction. So uh, I don't think this, you won't find anybody on the street that'll say, oh, he did a good job. If uh, you and I were put in charge of this, Lou, uh, even without knowing anything about it, we would have done a better job. Yeah, so I, I actually, I'm not that interested in this political stuff because uh, these things are, the, the responses to this are at very different levels, the federal level, the bureaucracy, and, you know, I'm willing to blame Trump for whatever you want to blame him. But we have a much more diffuse system than that. You can, in one ways, blame the president. In other ways, you can argue that different states did different things. And uh, let's take a look. I'm only saying that a rational approach from the outset, forget about politics, okay? A yeah. rational approach using science, um, you know, respecting science, would have resulted in a lot fewer deaths and, and a lot um, less stress for the economy too. 
Uh, and I and I agree with you that just doing a lockdown, you know, uh, just a well, total I, lockdown, I, actually, I, may I not have been the best idea in the first place. Right, I agree. But I'm I'm not sure whether we understood enough about this. I do think the Chinese kept us in the dark a bit, um, but you know we did learn. I, I'm not excusing any of these guys. Okay, I don't want to do that, but I do want to look at the numbers show. Okay, so let's. So one of the interesting things is that. If you look at the US, we now have a, a death rate of about 309 per million, okay? That's a good way to think about it. So the annual crude death rate for everything is about 8,400 per million, right? Per year. The annual crude death rate now is about 300 million. It's probably gonna rise by another 100 by the end of the year, right? Well, uh, it's, it's already, hasn't it already? Are you talking about the death rate in the ordinary course now? No, I'm talking about the death rate from COVID-19 today. Okay. All it's right. 309 per million. Well, yeah, it's easy to do that math. We have, you know, a population of 330 or so, and um, we yeah, have 100,000 deaths. very straightforward. In Spain, it's 580. In Italy, it's 547. In France, it's 438. In Germany, it's only 102. The death rate for Hawaii per million is 12. So if you're one, if by that metric, we should let the Hawaiian government run the entire world COVID-19 response, right? Because obviously <laughs> they have the one of the best performing uh, metrics. Now, well, do you understand why it's only 12? No, that's why this stuff is very interesting to me. We don't really have good data, but we're learning more. So there was some very interesting research that's come out in the next few, last few days. And really it has to do with the way we allocate resources in the US and what kind of information. So let's take a look at the next picture, the next slide here, which is COVID-19 deaths occurring in nursing home and assisting facilities. According about 0.62, like a little more than half a percent of the U.S. population lives in nursing homes or assisted living facilities, right? They are now, through a gross estimate, they're accounting for 43% of all the COVID-19 deaths. 43% among this small group of the population. And an analysis by Avik Roy and Greg Given. Uh, some of them write for Forbes, is that that number is probably too low. It's probably much higher, right? And if you look at Ohio, it's as much as 70%. And, and if you look at New York, New Jersey, Michigan, Michigan, right, they essentially ordered everybody who was, you know, in, from an assisted living facility who went to a hospital, got well enough to leave, to go back to the nursing home. Oddly enough, this governor of Florida, DeSantis, this guy who's been completely vilified by the press, he had a, a woman who ran his healthcare division, uh, her thing I think is Barbara Mayhew, and she told the hospitals, because under, and by the way, you have to think of how Medicare reimbursement works. Medicare reimbursement is an incentive to get people in and out of the hospital as soon as possible. If you're running a hospital and you have a Medicare patient, you want to take care of them and get them out of your hospital because your compensation is limited, right? She's told the hospitals, I don't care what the rules say or your reimbursement, we'll work about that later. If you have an active patient, you have a patient with an active COVID-19 uh, indicator, we are forbidding them to go back to the nursing home. We are also very early on, DeSantis made sure that those facilities, he banned visitors and guests, and he flooded the nursing homes with personal protection equipment. So DeSantis is this kind of, you know, problematic character, you could argue in some ways, you know, he's not very charismatic like Cuomo. And Cuomo got all this wonderful attention and people just love him. And, his brother interviewed him on CNN. DeSantis, on the other hand, was actually highly criticized because he didn't do a lockdown. But he, in fact, at the margin, did the most effective things. And he, as a result, 
has a very low, a relatively low death rate per million. And he spotted this nursing home issue and they managed it very quickly, very well. They had, so part of that is not just the sadness. He had- so Are you saying he has a low people. rate in general or, or just with nursing homes? Well, if you can stop the spread of the disease in nursing homes, you can cut the death rate because we now know it's a killing field for this thing, right? Yeah, well, that's true. But you and know, as you were saying before, we, we really don't know that much about it. We don't know, for example, unless you, you know, uh, why, why uh, nursing homes are so dangerous? Oh, we do know. We do what know is the people. reason? One is the uh, people are indoors. They are in facilities where they're close together. The help is moving around from room to room. If they are not well, if they're not engaged in very, a lot of, ex, a lot of outside visitors are coming in and many of them may be asymptomatic but are spreading the coronavirus. So the social distancing is, is very close and it's not being exposed. You know, it's, it's the, the quarters in these places are such that it moves all around the facility. Why this has not happened in Hawaii would be a very interesting question. You should try to get somebody on your program. Well, you have to have patient one, you know, right. you, have, you, have to, you have to start somewhere. And that's, that's why you can say that Hawaii has great numbers and it does. It has recently. great numbers. I'm not it saying had, it has had any cases in several days, but you know, the, you know, the problem is it only takes one. And then you really have to test and track and track and test and, right, but and, if you and, and limit the is, infection. Uh, and the other thing I was going to ask you that, you know, okay, I you described what happens in nursing homes, but what about the extraordinary rates in, in other similar circumstances like um, meatpacking plants? Well, uh, I think meatpacking. What, what's going on in meatpacking plants? So let's go, uh, let's talk about that. I mean, meatpacking is another thing. The air is probably pretty stale. You're packed together. It's hot or it's, uh, you know, it's enclosed. Uh, it's, you know, I, I just think it's a, a naturally uh, petri dish, a natural peat for spreading the virus, right? It's just not, now maybe there are things you can do, we're getting smarter, I suspect they'll be much better at uh, trying to find procedures to distance people. You know, there's going to be a big problem with the airlines. Right? The airlines are now, the manufacturers are now experimenting with different filter systems and and you know, it's only recently we've gotten a better sense of that this thing is mostly person to person or in or aerosol uh, contact spreading of the infection, not uh, contact off of spaces and not so-called fomite transmission. So, so let, let's go to the next one, which I think is a very interesting chart. Okay, well, what, is, what did the previous chart tell us, though? So it what just the, showed the percentage of deaths. Uh, that were occurring in uh, nursing homes, right? Okay. But, but the next one's better because this one shows you the share of nursing home and assisting facility death caused by COVID-19 per 10,000 residents, right? So this adjusts for population size. And you can see, for example, Nor Nor Montana is like seven, uh, New York, is uh, I think uh, looks like New York is an eight eight twenty seven. As you can see, the New England states, Pennsylvania, uh, Massachusetts, had very high numbers. You can see them here in the Northeast. Texas lower numbers. Even Seattle, where it broke out, broke out, is relatively no low numbers. They got on top of it, mm -hmm. but you know, it's really important to understand that. You as a, a, a person worried about, I'm, am I going to get this and die from this, right? You have to realize that your probability of getting this is probably half the published numbers if you are not living in a nursing home. That's what the data show. What, 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 the data why do you show say that what? You say half of the published numbers? Why is that? Because if you're not in a nursing because we know that well over, you know, half, about half, maybe well over half the deaths in part of the country are people who live in a nursing home. So if you take the, the total deaths, and it becomes, which 100,000, 
and 50,000 of those are in nursing homes. It's going to be more over time. At a minimum, CDC should be publishing this stuff. Say, look, if you don't live in a nursing home, your risk is lower by this much. It's important for people to know that. It's important for policymakers to know that in how they formulate strategies to do Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Uh, so we if don't you're know it. Open though. up Hawaii. You don't yeah. want to be operating on data as a risk factor that is based on a lot of information off of circumstances that are not taking place in Hawaii. Totally true, totally important. And the, we, we need to know the risk factors that we have to deal with. For example, yes. right. for example, I'm, uh, my personal belief is when you go outside, uh, the whole thing about the, the droplets uh, and, and the contagion through you know, breathing near someone um, is minimized because the wind is blowing. You have a breeze, you have a, and and so it 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 dilutes it. And uh, before you know it, the uh, what where you might have been in the the direct flow of somebody's breathing, you're no longer there. Not so only that. probably healthy for that, and it's an outdoor community, and I think that that probably helps. It's just one influence, one factor that also, we should know sun, about. Sunshine and temperature have a big that effect. That too. Yeah. On yeah, the yeah. So, but what I wanted to do is that you can but you know see what, you know what this tells me though, Lou? Right. If, if you and I were caused to make a decision or our respective families were caused to make a decision as to, we should, as to whether we should go into a senior facility at any price, take the most expensive place in the community at any price, wouldn't go. Wouldn't no, go because exactly. those factors are present and because the stats are terrible. Um, right, it's, right. it's like a death warrant to go. But also, these facilities also have high rates of communication of traditional influenza. Okay. So that's important to remember. First, you tend to die when you get really old. You need to keep that in mind. You're going to die of something. You need to keep that in mind also. But you don't want to have it accelerated by, I mean, if we had, if we had understood this and if we had focused on sort of turning these nursing homes into class five labs or something, you know, we'd really put a lot of effort, we probably could have cut the death rate nearly in half. Well, I mean, the Florida example- But you, you imply there that turning them into labs would be expensive and it may not worth, it was worth the effort right? or the money. But, but in but, fact, some of the things you would do are not costly. They're well, just I'm smart. Just, I'm just telling you, if you're going to take down, we think the national economy is probably contracted by as much as 20 to 30%. Yeah, that is trillions of dollars. Yeah, take my word. This would have been a cheap date. Of course, we would have had a contraction, even if we had no lockdown. People would have been nervous. We would have some level of contraction, but it wouldn't be as big as it is now. Without so, lockdown. if we could do this all again, and you and me, we yeah. we we went in a room and try to work it out, be smart as we could. Uh, we would say, look, in order to save the economy, the first thing you got to do is make people confident of the of the environment. And, yeah. and if that costs money, fine, because, you know, that, as you said, is ch it's cheap date compared to losing your whole economy. Absolutely. I mean, in the end, we're really, we're learning a lot here. So you can, you know, I mean, I, I'm not, I mean, I got plenty of problems with Trump, and I don't, but I don't really hang this entirely on him. There's a lot of players in this thing. CDC was really slow off the mark. They didn't understand it. They screwed up those tests. But you know, that's the nature of bureaucracy. That's the nature of bureaucracy. No, I, I don't. I, you know, we agreed not to not to put politics in here. But you know, the thing is, snapshot right now, what we need is smart, focused leaders and health leaders. Um, who, who give us clear signals about yeah. what we have to do and not do. And if you start right now at this moment in time, three o'clock on a given Wednesday, we should, we should have better instructions from whoever is, is handing us those, those instructions. And I'm afraid to say that the mistakes that were made before, let's put them behind us, but there'll be more mistakes going forward. That's, okay. what, it's, that's what it looks like. So, you know, let's take a look at the last picture because I think this really focuses where the problem is. And, and this shows you, if you run their model, uh, and this is having to do with uh, uh, Greg Gerbert and Abbott Roy, and you assume, uh, you assume we hit 150 deaths. I don't think that's an unreasonable 
worst case scenario. We're at 100,000. By the end of the year, we could get to 100. Well, why do you say 150, though? I mean, that, that sounds like pie in the sky in the sense that oh, we no, have everybody out. went to the they went to the parades. They went to the concerts. They went to the beaches. We haven't paid the price for that yet. Well, it depends how we do with the social distancing for the different age groups. Now, take a look at this data. This is why the data is important. If we take a look here, we can see that now this is the uh, deaths per million people, right? Remember, the state of Hawaii is about, uh, what did I say, 15 or 17, but 12. The state of Hawaii is 12 per million, right? Mm -hmm. So per million is a way to think about it. The crude death rate for society is about 8,400 a year, 8,400 per million. And we see that for the U.S. as a whole, COVID-19 adds about 310 per million, right? But you can see that this death rate is highly distributed, uh, uh, in, unevenly distributed against older folks, right? Yes. So if you're greater than 85, your crude death rate, the crude death rate doubles. So if you have about 0.8%, uh, 8,400 per million is about a point, a 0.8% probability of dying it's now moved to 1.6%, right, for the whole society. But for that particular age group, it's probably gone from, I don't know, 85, I think is about a 14% uh, probability. It's probably gone from 14 to 28%, I suspect. It's probably nearly doubled. It has. You can see 7302. No, it's gone up by about 25%, even for the oldest people. So... It's a lot, but it's against a relatively small number. But this data suggests to me, right, that if you could just find a way to directly address the risks on the older segment of the population, you could really get control of this in a way that would allow the rest of the economy to go. Now, I'm in the geezer cohort, right, like a lot of people. So... But I feel I don't have any comorbidity. So this information is useful. It suggests I should be careful. But on the other hand, if I could get on an airplane and go to Honolulu or visit friends in Japan tomorrow, I would probably do that. So, uh, well, I, I, are you saying that um, it's time? It's time for us to uh, get out there? Because uh, yes. I, don't, I don't have a high level of confidence of that. I think we're well, about the reason to have I a, a resurgence is myself. Because I think the cost to the economy is too high. And we have to let individuals, including businesses, figure out how they're going to deal with this. And whether it's different seating at restaurants. I don't think the government can fix this all themselves. We need to give the public what they need to do. Give them the procedures and the uh, information they need. To protect themselves, and can, can I add something to that? The risk data. I don't. I don't think the government has helped us in the slightest here. We have a hundred thousand people has died. You could fill up the whole New York Times, not just the front page, and maybe the New York Times for weeks with all the the names of these people who died, and they died in in agony, and they died without their families. It's hard to capture that on an emotional level. But you know what? What's happened is that um, you know we we really haven't done anything clear and we have got to do that to make me feel confident that i can go out there you know this thing you mentioned about the, the various factors influences variables you know what this data tells us on this conduct and that conduct and this environment and that environment that's very valuable if i had that i'd feel a lot better um and, and businesses would be a lot more responsive if we had that kind of instruction. CDC, as you mentioned, has not provided it. The White House has not provided it. They're telling us to take drugs that have been debunked. Um, there's, there's really no guidance coming down. And I suggest to you that you're not gonna feel confident and neither am I and, and a lot of other people that I know until there is clear guidance. And it has to come from one place, not 50 states or thousands of towns that you know, most of this has to come from one place. Well, and that I, means a federal government. I just think these communities are different. I don't think, I don't in think- In some ways all, they are. In I some ways think, they are, but the I larger the issue risk, is the federal government. The larger issue is the, is the country in general because think, it's an epidemic. 
I think the government can do a lot of positive things and they're spending a lot of money on vaccines and, and ventilators and yada, all this stuff. But the policies that work in New York City are not the same as the policies that will work in Honolulu. It's just completely different communities. For the federal government to say, you guys do it, take care of it, it's your problem, and then blame them when, when it doesn't work is not helpful. And I think the federal government, I agree with you that, that, that it, it differs from town to town and village to village, but we have, we have to have national policies, national advice and counsel. I think we need, we need the resources of the government to undertake the research. And the resources, right. And the resources to deal with the medical and the public health issues. But we need the information so in, individuals can make informed decisions on risk. They make them now in lots of areas. They make informed decisions on risk when they drive a car, when they go surfing. Well, maybe that's not important, but then we go surfing. Maybe not so informed, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, but what you've done, I mean, looking at the data, you're a data guy, Lou, and looking yeah. at the data is so important. So it's getting the data, it's getting good data, and it's analyzing the data. It's having conversations like this and ultimately finding policy and finding advice and counsel to you know, 330 million people. Um, yeah. That's what we need to do. And I'm afraid uh, we have yet to do it. So the question to me, and we'll have to leave it soon here. The question to me is, um, you know, are we going to have a resurgence? And if we do, I suspect we'll have at least some resurgence, at least. Um, if we do have a resurgence, how is that going to affect public confidence? So apparently how is that going to affect the economy? So Fauci is saying we may not get a resurgence, and that's a whole nother topic. We've spent a lot of time looking at that. Who, you know, innate immune systems versus uh, our T cell immune systems. And we've talked to a lot of people because this is very important in terms of how people feel when they, in other words, they have to have confidence to go to a restaurant or a bar, get in their car, go on big holiday. So, this, this is a topic for a further meeting, I suspect. <laughs> you, you know in your heart it is anyway. <laughs> yeah, we got to continue this conversation because I, I think you're right. Uh, there's a, a, an intrinsic connection between energy and the economy and of course between the economy and public health these days. So let's continue the conversation. Let's continue the, you know, the gathering and evaluation of the data yeah. such as you, you have been able to do that. Uh, and, and, and in the meantime, Lou, stay out of the senior facilities and, and stay healthy, will you? My we wife tried to put me in there. <laughs> <laughs> we need you, Lou. Yeah, Thank okay. you so much. Aloha. Talk to you next time. Aloha. Aloha. Take Bye. care. Wash your hands.